Well, welcome back, everyone. Today, I'm honored to be joined by Mr. Stephen Haney. Thanks for joining me. Hey, glad to be here. Thanks, Jackson. Yeah, it's a pleasure. So uh, we'll jump right in. Um, you worked at Amazon for many years. Uh, what drew you there originally? <laughs> uh, so yeah, I worked at Amazon for many years, and you know, how do you want to go back? But I, you know, a couple things I think are important because we're sitting here in 2024. Uh, and uh, you need to set the context a little differently. I joined Amazon in 2003. Amazon started in 1994, and so if you go back to 2003, you got to put yourself a couple things are true. One is the majority of books were still sold in the physical bookstore, so there's Borders and Barnes and Noble. Um, I'd have to look back at what the top websites were, but I think it's like ESPN. Uh, and okay. you know, while, yeah. it's been a while. There's not like the, you know, MySpace might have been like the community site. Facebook hadn't really launched yet uh, in 2003. I wasn't born yet. You weren't born yet, right? Yeah. So, you know, I think I did my first computer programming in fifth grade. Um, and I made a little turtle go around the screen, you know, as opposed to people I hired later, they'd made their first web page in second grade. So it's a bit of a, you know, there's no iPhone in 2003, right. there's no iPhone. So what drew me to Amazon? Um, my wife, Megan and I had uh, gotten married in 2001, uh, and we had gotten this book, um, gotten this idea from a book, book, uh, author named Richard Lamb, university, uh, published book about following Jesus in the real world. And the idea that we got was most people, uh, can get their job search backwards. They start with a job search and then that takes them to a place and then that takes them to a church. Right. Or I'm going to go to this college to do this degree and that takes me far away and then that brings me to a place and a church. And uh, the, the book, Following Jesus in the Real World, suggests that you, s uh, inside that out, start with the people uh, and then uh, people in that church, uh, assuming you're a Christian, you're going to be around Christians. Uh, and then that takes you and that's your place. And then what are the needs that you can serve there and, and what skills cause God puts you there and God wired you up with skills. Um, God wired you up with gifts and talents and abilities. So we were in Chicago, um, and we were starting our family. We'd been married for uh, 2003, we'd been married for two years. And we said, where do we know people? Where do we know a church? Uh, and um, what fits with our abilities. Megan is a labor and delivery nurse and enjoys midwifery, and uh, Illinois is not great for that. So short story long, uh, Seattle was one of the five different cities where we had made a list of people we knew and, and churches we, we saw um, that we would be uh, blessed by and able to contribute to. Uh, so we started looking work in those places, and uh, I had passed my resume to, because this is pre-LinkedIn, I had passed my resume to someone I had worked with in consulting who passed it on to someone who happened to work at Amazon. I had worked at Starbucks in Seattle, and so really it was one of the companies in Seattle could I find work with, and that would get us there. So I ended up finding work at Amazon. Now, Amazon was on my list. I was a supply chain guy, um, so I did demand forecasting and material movement uh, in the warehouse or in production, but also distribution and customer demand. And to go to Amazon was like going to the New York Yankees of supply chain uh, because, you know, what they did for inventory turns and uh, just how they moved product to people's doors because that was the magic of Amazon. You put your credit card on this computer screen and a box showed up at your door. And that's what we had to sell people on in the 1990s and, and early 2000s it was really just trusting if you put your credit card in this thing will show up at your door. We're not going to scam you. <laughs> we're not going to scam you. Right? Yeah. Uh, we're not going to scam you. Uh, in my office around the corner here, I have uh, an 1897 Sears catalog. Because Sears had to do the same thing back yeah. in the 1900s. You mail us money <laughs> and you could have a house. You could buy a house from Sears. But things will show up at your door. Uh, and that element of trust uh, was, was what got me to Amazon. was the opportunity to be part of... How do you build supply chain uh, in an e-commerce world? How do you build that transaction? How do you estimate customer demand um, and uh, the opportunity? So uh, there's other things that, that I knew from Amazon. I, I knew that it was an opportunity. So I was in um, just 30 and uh, I looked for opportunities where I could be around and kind of be the dumbest guy in the room and learn. Uh, yeah. So I wanted to have something that I was good at that I could contribute uh, in, in the job, but I wanted to learn and really drive my learning velocity from the people around me, the problems we were solving, and, uh, and then the opportunity to 
be at the intersection of technology and business. Yeah. You talked about um, kind of seeing, looking at opportunities as far as like, what is a church that I really like or think I can tr- contribute to? And then from that, what are business ventures? When it comes to a th- something like a university, surely there's times when it's like, okay, I'm going to the university because this offers the best degree of education for the field I'm studying in. And then, oh, and oh, there's, it's great that there's a church there, right? That's one of the, the precursors. That's one of the things that has to happen. But you start with the university, right? Okay. Is that, is that, are you recommending that as like, because surely there are times when that is what you have to do. Is you say, I'm going to this university because it has the best education in this specific field. And there's a church there. Um, as opposed to starting it the other way around. Yeah, you know, I, I haven't been consistent in my life on this point. So, and, and I'll explain that for a minute uh, as well, because that's part of what got me here to lovely Moscow, Idaho. So, um, I had an opportunity. So, first off, I, w- I would add a couple more elements. Remember, I was 30, I had a wife, we had one child, we had another child on the way. So, I think there, you know, there's a different set of responsibilities that I had as a husband and father right. um, on how much risk I could take or where I would choose to, I'm not just moving myself, right? So most people going to university don't necessarily have the responsibility to a wife or family or children. So the risk they can afford to take is, is a little different in their selection. Um, my fourth year of university, I spent in Munich, Germany, and I, I um, had an opportunity to do, jun- it was called junior abroad, but I did it my senior year, junior in Munich. Uh, I got accepted to the program. Um, I didn't know if there was a church there before I chose to go to the program. Right? And, and that may have been a risk in, in my less mature Christian life. May not have been something I should have looked at, but God is faithful. And turns out I tried to go to German churches uh, and I found myself with old ladies and some sermons. I really, my German just wasn't quite good enough. Uh, I was not being discipled. Um, and uh, I found an English speaking church, uh, that, uh, on any given Sunday has 10 countries and four continents represented. Uh, and what a blessing that was. Yeah. And through that, I had a great Bible study. We had a great reformed Baptist pastor and God was faithful to put me in a church even there, but I didn't have my decisions in order. I went to do the junior year in Munich program and, and really push on my German studies, um, without knowing there was a church first. Fortunately, God is faithful. Yeah. And then when you moved to Amazon, you you saw it because you were there for uh, 16 years, 16 years, Just yeah. almost 16 years. Yeah. You saw the rise of going from physical bookstores to Amazon becomes this global yeah. powerhouse. <laughs> yeah. yeah. What we were there is, is, and what I appreciated and it's hindsight. So hindsight is 2020. It's the Monday right. quarterback. Uh, when I got there in 2003, my f- one of my first jobs, um, besides my first job was to become the Christmas Grinch, but that's a different story here in a minute. Um, the, uh, my first job was how do we automate our inventory purchasing? Because we were expanding from books and music and videos, um, DVDs and VHS tapes to all these other categories. So, um, in a traditional process, you might have a buyer and that buyer cuts purchase orders well, if we're going to go to 10, 15 more categories, kitchen products, consumer electronics, do I need to have a set of buyers for each one of those? Well, that doesn't right. scale very fast. So my job was to help automate purchase order generation and really learned um, how to build software where people run the machines instead of the machines running people. What I mean by that is a lot of software spits out tasks. You know, here's another mm-hmm. task for you to do. Here's another task for you to do. And you can never win that way because machines are faster. And so you end up with, um, you know, there's a funny video clip of I Love Lucy at the Chocolate Factory and she's supposed to pack the chocolates and she can't keep up and she stuffs them, starts eating them and stuffs them in her apron and everything else. Whereas if you use computers for what they're good for, which is calculations and then task automation and use humans to manage settings. So validate settings. What are the lead times that we should Humans know better for lead times. Um, and then we can start calculating those too, but having humans basically moving the mixing board of a computer, um, when managing you, the inputs. Yeah. When did you realize you were going to have to make that shift? 
uh, that's how Amazon worked from day one. So, okay. you know, um, it's, it's manage the inputs and, and let the computers, you know, humans manage the machines, not the machines manage humans, was a just engineering principle uh, right. from when I got there. But that was my assignment was to scale. How do we build uh, and adjust our software? Um, which my expertise was the process of purchasing. Uh, and when you do PO generation for a books, you can just do a list of books and send them to a distributor. Say, I want one of these and two of these and three of these and fours and, and another one of those. Um, and they'll send you a confirmation back. We confirm this. We don't confirm this. When you start buying drills, uh, say DeWalt drills, they have to come. you got to buy a pallet. Now I have to deal with minimum orders. Um, if you're going mm-hmm. to buy uh, diamonds, uh, you're dealing with very low, often very low tech vendors or suppliers yes. uh, or diapers, you know, you're calling by the truckload. So I uh, remember one phone call, Amazon always hasn't been the powerhouse. Uh, and in the software transaction over EDI files, um, we needed one little field adapted and I think I called Kimberly Clark and we're like, hi, this is you know, Stephanie from Amazon. We want to talk about a modification to the standard EDI transaction. And they're like, yeah, you're not Walmart. You're not Target. Goodbye. <laughs> it's like, oh, okay. We'll have to uh, figure that out a different way. Yep. Uh, it's a little more negotiating power now. Yeah. yeah. And uh, EDI yeah. meaning? Uh, EDI is a computer uh, protocol or it's a, a data protocol, uh, electronic data interface that's okay. commonly used. You know, API would be a more updated in our new world. Got it. There you go. Yeah. So and I was so, there, yeah, just to be clear, I was there 2003 to 2019. So yeah. I saw a big shift of change over time. Yeah, it's a, that's a pretty drastic shift. And so when you're looking at these, um, you're trying to figure out how many do we order and um, how can we get them distributed the, the quickest so that there's the least turnover time. How do you go about that process? Because that's a, that's a big task. Yeah. Uh, and it, it may seem somewhat impossible to kind of guess how many people are going to order. Yeah, a you know, product. you know, we'll we'll talk about it a little bit. I'm not sure it'll be super interesting to your listeners. Um, the that first five years at Amazon, I worked on retail systems, and we had buyers, and so I was working with our buyers to understand what should buyers do, and what should the software do. But I think the um, the thing that I continually see today is. Um, in, in my role at, at Honor, and often as people um, tend to solution, product managers will come and say, oh, we need this solution, we need this solution. And they have the idea of a solution, and they bring you the solution rather than taking a step back and solving the problem. Because software, uh, software just automates business decisions, and I, I often will say software is not the solution. Um, you need to take a step back and go, what is the process and the the tasks in the process that we're trying to get done. So we need to evaluate, and there's elements of time in that. So we need to evaluate a purchase quantity or how do we calculate a purchase quantity and how do we do that with a lead time? Um, and then you can evaluate where do we apply software? Should we, you can do buy build decisions. Should we buy someone software? But that process of that, that work of starting with the process, um, uh, and going, what are the steps that need to be done? Um, and then you can also apply some fun pieces to it. Of, um, and over time, uh, there's different layers of Amazon history. I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, but by working on that process and going, is it working? Is it working? Being curious, could we do it better? And really applying, you know, can we eliminate steps in the process? And if we can't eliminate it, can we automate it? And if we can't automate it, can we make it cheaper? And what I mean by making it cheaper is, hey, you know, everyone is uniquely equipped. Everyone has a certain price. Do I need a VP to do this? Do I need a, you know, someone with a lot of experience to do this? Or could I have this done by, you know, fairly intelligent but more junior people with less experience? It's a way to make it cheaper. Could I send it to a you know, lower cost country and, and make it cheaper? So taking apart those processes, knowing when uh, something is working well. Amazon, um, when I interview people from Amazon or talk to people who are there, there's such a leader driven, big mental model thinking. So we hired a senior vice president, uh, Mark Anetto, who'd been big in Kaizen and, mm-hmm. and Toyota manufacturing. And so for those two, three years, like everybody at Amazon thought about Kaizen and seven forms of waste and how to apply that. And then a couple of years later, we started doing a lot more with data science and everyone at Amazon uh, thinks about how do we apply data science and algorithms, uh, machine learning, 
to a problem. So there was really these themes at Amazon uh, during my time there every couple years, often driven down from a leader or a big senior leader that would pervasively go across the company. They weren't isolated to one department, yeah. but everybody thought about a problem solving method and how to apply that problem solving method in, in your business. So I yeah. was in retail systems, but I thought a lot about Toyota and Kaizen um, and had to understand it. And then I was in uh, the third party seller marketplace and had to think about data science and um, it's, it's makes a really interesting, enjoyable place to work. Learning, yeah. And learning. It's, right. Cause you're constantly learning. Is that kind of, in your opinion, one of the things that differentiated Amazon and made it so great, the powerhouse that it is today? Yeah. Um, there's a, a book called working backwards by, um, uh, uh, two former Amazon leaders, Bill Carr and Colin. Um, and they describe six core mechanisms, uh, that makes Amazon work. Um, and it could almost be an onboarding training manual. If you want to work and succeed at Amazon, here's the history of how these six mechanisms came to be and then how you, how you work on them. Right. Um, one of the books, uh, cause Amazon was a very book reading place was that um, every year there's also books in these themes. And in that 2003, 2004, one of the books was called Execution. Uh, it's a book by Larry Bossidy. It's a strategy book. And, and the, one of the core premises is there's nothing unique about Amazon strategy. It's, it's commerce. You know, we'd like to sell you something. You'd like to buy something. Um, so uh, how we execute and the execution discipline at Amazon um, – became the focus like we need to be really focused on consistent disciplined execution so you'd see posters up about 99 percent isn't good enough because the volume of transactions that we're doing in operations if you're just doing 99 percent that's a lot of failures and they right. they they apply like if if airplane landings were only 99 percent successful how many more crashes would we have builds out the 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 picture right so what um, to look back and there's lots of people who have done this. I've talked with this. I was there. I think execution discipline is key, but I think one of the most important things um, is is something that uh, we think about um, a lot in in our community. And you and I have talked about a little bit. How do you pass things on? In our case, we talk about how do you pass things on to your children. Well, uh, Amazon was hiring hundreds of people when I started. There were in in Seattle. There were roughly two thousand employees in two thousand three. Uh, right. there's tens of thousands more than that now in yeah. less than 10 years. Um, then, and then another 10 years. So how do you bring people on and then quickly assimilate them? And, and I think that's been the secret success to Amazon is one of those is Amazon builds mechanisms and systems, systems produce what systems produce. And, and so when you don't get the result you want, you go back and look at components of the system. Amazon has a very, um, defined way of evaluating systems and businesses yeah. are systems and organizations are part of a system. And the second thing is Amazon has their leadership principles, which is like a business OS. Um, when you interview, you're being evaluated to Amazon 16 leadership principles. You're effectively getting your first performance review of your old work against Amazon criteria because your promotions and your uh, performance evaluations uh, will be conducted to these leadership principles. And, you know, some of them have been well known, learn and be curious, uh, think big, dive deep, customer obsession. Um, and, and then there's some, what do those look like at Amazon? Uh, and that's, you know, how Amazon, I think, brought on a lot of people and then quickly assimilated them to be effective in teams uh, running the systems that Amazon built. Yeah. Talk to me about the Christmas Grinch. <laughs> so, uh, <clears throat> this is one of the fun stories I got in there and, uh, you know, again, I'm old, so Excel only handled uh, 200,000 rows, 216,000 rows, or 169,000 rows. I forget what it was. But um, that'll come up in a second. Amazon's model at the time was you placed an order. We didn't carry the inventory in stock. We, you placed an order for a book. We, uh, we would go buy it from a special order distributor. Because, again, what Jeff realized at the time, uh, Jeff, Jeff Bezos' idea for Amazon was there's all these people joining the Internet. Uh, the rate of internet usage was just every day was accelerating kind of like chat GPT today. Um, and there's no commerce there. So I want to put commerce there. What would be good commerce there? 
Well, most of the books, as I said, were physical bookstores. Most physical bookstores could handle 35 to 40,000 titles in the store. Um, and if you wanted a title that's not in their 35,000, they'd go to their computer or to a catalog. They'd look it up and they'd call one of two distributors. There were only two distributors in the United States that would, and Jeff's like, great, I can take that search process and cut the bookstore out of the middleman. I can just have you go to a website, search yourself, do the special order. And to us, it doesn't, to you, it doesn't look like a special order. You just ordered from Amazon and we will make it show up at your door. Well, not everything shows up. <laughs> and so the Grinch part was uh, how many things are on order. Uh, what I was asked to, uh, to uh, analyze was how many things are on order from a customer with a promise of delivery before Christmas that are not going to show up before Christmas. Got it. And that's the Grinch because yeah. uh, the year before I got there, Amazon had sent a bunch of emails at midnight Seattle time on December 24th. Uh, the uh, around December 23rd. So people woke up Christmas Eve morning with a, yeah, that thing you thought you were going to get for a Christmas present, it's not coming. Good Sorry. luck. <laughs> Sorry. We call those cold prickly emails. Yeah. Uh, and so my job was basically, please reduce the number of cold prickly emails and t let's tell the customer uh, as soon as we can uh, the day before, not the day before Christmas. Right. Good luck. Go to the mall. Yeah. So... Um, that was a great project because I, you know, the first part was talk about learning. Uh, I'm like, well, how do I access this data? And my boss handed me a book uh, on, called Learning Pearl. <laughs> and uh, as an O'Reilly guy to learn Pearl. And uh, he's like, go read this over the weekend. Yeah. So I was like, okay, I'll learn Pearl. Uh, I know how to do Excel. I know how to do SQL. Um, but I'm going to learn how to do Pearl. Um, and uh, so, great, go figure it out. Uh, so we reduced... Uh, Kind of two days after I got the assignment, we went into a senior leader, um, and this got this 99% uh, message across. And the MBA who'd had the problem last year, it's like, well, you know, here are the number of defects. We were 99.4%. We think we make improvement. And the leader just, this is not a percent problem. If we make a promise to a customer, we don't deliver. Every one of those is a defect failure. We shouldn't have made the promise if we can't deliver. And, um, you know, what, how many absolute misses did we have? Not, you know, the percents, but the absolute number of misses. And it was in the hundreds of thousands. Right. He's like, you just disappointed the entire town of Des Moines, Iowa for Christmas. You ruined <laughs> Christmas for all of Des Moines. Like you need to put this in context. So it was a really important lesson just to see like in business, you can tend to get focused on the, the roll up metrics, the 99%, what are the totals? And you forget that each absolute miss, um, absolute numbers matter. Yeah. Uh, so we got to know it. Yeah. And I, I feel like Amazon shipping has kind of fallen off a little bit. It's uh, <laughs> now a little, uh, a, a little bit back to its old days of missing. Uh, you know, I'm sure somebody's looking at those numbers. Yeah. Uh, and it is a little more complicated system than it was in 2003. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure it is. Yes. Um, Amazon's obviously very competitive. Um, what were the down and upsides that you noticed from, uh, from that competitive nature? Um, well, there's different angles to that. You know, I, I like to describe, you know, as I was thinking about the question asked earlier, I was drawn to Amazon in part because the opportunity to learn and pursue excellence. Um, it was the, you know, New York Yankees of supply chain, right? right. I'm going to go get to be part of that and contribute it, put on the pinstripes, if you will, um, and learn and pursue excellence. Um, the one of the things that I described Amazon as I was recruiting people, I'd worked at Microsoft, I'd worked at Starbucks, I'd worked in consulting a number of company cultures. Early days, Amazon was um, very much I would describe as a rugby culture because uh, and uh, you'd get in a room and you're wrestling with a problem and the problem could be this cold prickly problem. Um, right. Right. And the, the first th choice is not to notify customers they're not going to get something the first choice is how do we go get it yeah uh so if we see things that are at risk so literally there were times where the whole floor of employees would stop at five stores on the way home to try to buy ipods or you know uh, there's some customer service stories that in that try to buy a doll or whatever the favorite toy was um so you're pursuing excellence and the competitiveness but so you get in a room you're trying to solve this problem and, and people are like that's a dumb idea 
right? He was very academic, though. And that's what I mean by rugby. Like, we're pushing on each other. Like, I don't think that's going to solve the problem. Is that really the problem? We were testing for truth. Uh, and there was this pursuit of, of, of truth, this, this dig deep to be curious about what is the actual problem? Is that how you measure it? So the standard for no, like do we know at Amazon, is um, much higher than most companies uh, that have been at. You know, it's like, is that really the accurate measurement? Um, and some of it comes from many early Amazon employees were PhD program dropouts in physics and biology. And they had come from an academic environment, working in Unix with big chunks yeah. of data, proving and disproving hypotheses. Right. Uh, and so that, the competitors there, and then, you know, you'd leave and you'd go have a cup of coffee together because people who'd walked in that might go, that was really harsh. And in today's current, you know, I would say social kindness of conversation, people might be affronted. Um, and it was probably hard for me and others, not probably, it was hard for me and others, as Amazon was less out of the, are we going to survive? Are we going to keep making cash flow <laughs> days to, hey, it's all good. It's yeah. not as urgent as it was. Right. Like you had to leave some of those behaviors behind. Yeah. Other company cultures I've been in had been more like a boxing match where you beat up on the person um, and it was equally harsh, but you left a meeting feeling like there was a winner and a loser. Right. Amazon, you, in those early days, you left feeling like, you know, man, we didn't solve the problem. My idea kind of stunk. Or, man, I'm glad that person had that idea. Um, I'm glad we got to a good idea. Um, so the second part of excellence and competitiveness was simply, um, you remember, at the growth rate that Amazon was having. Um, I got to be part of the Amazon Marketplace team from 2009 to 2016. That business grew from nine billion to two hundred billion dollars uh, in revenue, um, you know, and that growth rate. You know, if you've read the book Jim Collins, Good to Great, uh, it's a good to great story. It meets yeah. all the criteria of a, a good to great. So you have to ask yourself: if the company's growing at twenty percent, are my skills growing at twenty percent? Right. Because every day that I come to work, I'm managing a bigger business. Uh, yeah. The simple example I often use in interviews was when I. Came in, I uh, was doing this purchasing software. I had to answer the question, how many vendors are we doing automated purchasing with? And it was 400. Three months later, it was 4,000. And so you think, go back about the process, like how do you do it? Some of it's just keeping up. Yeah. Uh, if you currently manage your bills by a billing clerk and they're getting 400 envelopes every day of invoices and or faxes, because again, it's 2003, uh, there may not be an email, um, and now they get 4,000, right? right? Are you going to add 10 more people? Yeah, because you just 10x the problem. No, you have to work differently. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. And um, it's interesting because I don't think that, and I'd love to hear if you agree or disagree, but I don't think that kind of atmosphere is for everyone. Um, no, it's I, not. <laughs> yeah. There are some people that just shouldn't work at a company like Amazon. Probably not. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, when you're in that highly competitive environment, the goal is always customer success, correct? Mm -hmm. um, and not, as you mentioned, a boxing match, just trying to beat, beat everyone up. Um, so your personal goal, as far as like dealing with other people around you, was it kind of, were you trying to excel past them? Um, or <laughs> how do you go about trying to become better than you are, but not, um, especially at that highly competitive level without trying to step on and kill everyone else? Um, well, you start from abundance. So what's convenient when your business is growing 20, 30, 40, 50%, there is plenty for everybody to go around. Everybody's job is getting bigger. And so part of getting better was really I need, I need to be better in order to keep pulling my share uh, of the load across my teammates. Right. Right. So I don't have to be better than you. Um, I actually need you to be better than you are too. Uh, and I need to be better because our business is growing. So in order for us to keep driving the load, um, that's the first, the, the first, like the, Especially in the, in these early days, you know, and and Jeff was very present, you know, but so a lot of things I can attribute to Jeff comments, Jeff statements, but um, he was very present, very directive. Uh, 
one of the statements is we have more ideas uh, than we have capable people to execute on them. So Amazon is a fairly difficult place to interview into because they, uh, one of their leadership principles is hire the best. Right. Um, and it's better to not hire a B player, if you will, or a C player uh, who can do a little bit of work. It's better to wait and not get the work done uh, and hire an A player. Uh, because also you're thinking long term um, and you're thinking about what you need to do. So I, I sometimes described Amazon and, and for me, um, the back to your, not necessarily a place for everyone. Um, it is like there's a, a, a um, it hits three things that are unusual in a lot of places. You get to work with amazing people uh, at a, who are consistently at a fairly high level of intelligence. A lot of companies, you may work with some really intelligent people. You work with a wider variety of people. But Amazon consistently, you know, um, uh, high intelligence Top people. tier. You get to drive innovation. Um, now, startups, you get to drive innovation. But here's the difference. Uh, Amazon, when you drive innovation, it impacts billions of people. Um, you know, and, and my opportunity, when I, as I finished my time at Amazon, working on the Amazon detail page, like literally, you know, we would say one-seventh of the world's population looked at our software. Uh that's awesome. So you get those three things and, and there's other places like this, you know, to be at a top tier university and top tier research lab, other you know, highly impactful, smart, you know, certain military. Um, and you have to remember, I had to remember there's time you just put your tools down. Like it's fun to go to work. It's fun to get better. It's really enjoyable, but that is not my entire identity of my life. Um, and, and so, you know, I made a, a number of mistakes over time and, and, you know, in kind of my thirties, forties and had some great elders and, um, you know, just point out, like, are you working on being as great a husband or as great a father as, as you are in succeeding at work? Uh, cause it's easy and there's this nice structure, uh, for me to succeed at work. Um, and so you had to, you have to think about that. Um, that's where I found is less about the, um, and I think also it's comforting on the second part, like. Hey, I don't have to worry um, about promotions. I don't have to worry about the fairness of them. Like, first of all, Amazon was fairly meritocracy, but also I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm not in control. God's in control, so right. you know, I'll just do the right thing and, and work for the Lord and and uh, see what happens. Know, take, take what comes. Yeah, talk to me about that work life balance and kind of finding as a Christian mm-hmm. finding the the right well the right balance. Yeah. Well, I'm going to kind of pull back in on what I or take us back to what I said before. Um, uh, you have to have enough focus. When people tend to think about work life balance, they immediately go to the negative side and where should I cut off my work? You know, what uh, to make more room for life? Um, I would suggest um, focus on life and, uh, you know, make the problem like, how do I fit my work in? So as you know, I have a bunch of children. Yes. Uh, uh, so my wife and I have seven wonderful children. Um, and uh, we had uh, work uh, church community and we had school community. Uh, we would get involved in you know, singing or in cycling or uh, you know, activities, sports. And, and so for me, it was, hey, um, you know, do I have... Uh, that was my first part of work, work life balance. Um, and when people would ask me at Amazon, cause I was always weird. Uh, you know, when I got there, the fact that I had kids was weird. And then I always had more kids Seven than most. Kids <laughs> I like, always had more they kids. They just than, keep coming out. Yeah. What's, they just keep going coming. On? Um, but we'd get these, all these MBAs in. And, and so I think the second thing is understanding rhythms and seasons. There are rhythms and seasons. My wife knew the first year at Amazon was an investment year. I had to learn Pearl on a weekend. Um, and so just, two things I would suggest to people on recognizing rhythms and seasons. Um, it takes, uh, there's going to be certain times of year where, yeah, you'd probably need to work the 40, 50, 60 hour weeks at your work, uh, and your life, your home, your family, um, will take a hit with you, uh, because you're not there. Um, you are, you're, are in on this thing. Um, so if it takes six weeks to make a habit, um, do it four to six weeks to make a habit, you got to watch out when you have these seasons at work to do something as an intervention 
to not let that new level of become the habit. Become the habit. Yeah. So we would do our annual planning cycle, uh, you know, and uh, that would usually take four to six weeks. And I'm like, I'm taking a two week vacation uh, directly after that planning cycle. Um, or whatever the, the hat may be. Second thing is understanding in your work life, um, covenant unions matter. And this took a long time for me to get to like, you're at work, your wife's at home. Like, is it really, no, no, no. You're, you, you know, it's some great elders are like, you're living with this person and you know, they are probably uniquely equipped to recognize things that you don't. Uh, and so at talking to your, your spouse about, Hey, this is the situation. What do you see in it? Um, right. You know, there, yes, there's unique contributions, but there's opportunity to be more together than not. And, yeah. uh, that's often, which also means often don't missed. marry an idiot. You know, <laughs> that comes along, that comes along with it. Uh, most of us do marry up, but yes. 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 Um, then you worked with, maybe might have a question here. Yeah. Um, you worked with the, the final buying process and keeping customers on the page. Yeah. Getting through that process and actually clicking buy what were your biggest takeaways there um and the improvements that you made yeah. in that well let me just give that that 16 year train so i started in the back end like in the warehouses with supply chain and we're bringing products into the warehouse and i really got um built expertise in how people drive processes and building efficient process workflow uh within system i took that and started in the third party marketplace business and we enable small businesses to sell on amazon and so i got to double down um on how do you build a workflow uh, to make it easy for a business to do things in bulk or to how do you list a lot of prices, but also see secondary interactions. Um, you, you have a business who wants to list their things for sale and they put it into this spreadsheet looking thing that somehow turns into a detail page right? <laughs> and it may not be the best things, the best like detail page experience between the two. Um, so I worked a lot and helped third party businesses grow. Um, and again, worked a lot on workflow processes and marketplace tools and building recommendations for businesses. And then I came to the final front end and got to run the magic money button of the internet and the Amazon detail page. And so I got to wake up every day and think about how do I make it easier on to shop for anything, right. uh, clothing, furniture, even books. Uh, because if you think about things as, uh, so I talk about the abundance mentality also like, the the books detail page that was Amazon's original detail page, you know. Is there still something to invent twenty four years later? Yeah, you know. Uh, and in 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 two thousand seventeen, like, hey, we've got it figured out. No, iPhones have changed things. Like, there's a lot that 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 you can still do. And so that the abundance mentality is one, but the day one mentality of how do we get curious, um, remembering that you know we are creators and there's still new ways to solve a problem because there's things we haven't discovered yet or there's different materials or different approaches right um so yes i've i've looked a lot at at how people shop and and the the the, the questions that people go through and how they shop and how they shop for books is a little different than clothes yeah, or uh, diamonds or diamonds but actually, uh, some people shopping for a ski jacket is just as technical a shopping purchase as shopping for a new laptop because it's the questions that people go through right. to answer. They want compatibility. They want the zippers to work a certain way. They want a certain you know, uh, length. They want it to be fitting with their other gear. They want it to do a job, right? right. Versus I'm buying an evening dress. Well, I'm buying an evening dress for my wife, uh, not for me. I don't, you, yeah. you don't seem like the kind you, to wear dresses. I'm not an evening dress kind of guy. But, yeah. um, you know, I care more about do they have things to go with it or how's the swoosh or what's the feel of the fabric. Right. Uh, so how do we communicate to a person when we're shopping virtually? I get to wake up every day and think, well, how do I make this easier? Yeah. Um, is it bigger pictures? Is it video? What are the words that people look at uh, when they're and which words are important? Right. And so for the average customer out there who um, is on the page and just finds themselves constantly like in the cycle of buying things <laughs> <laughs> because, you, because you've done your job too well, um, how do you make sure that uh, the, the purchase decisions you're making are um, informed and logical as opposed to just like the page is sweeping me through? <laughs> Good luck. Good luck. <laughs> Good luck. 
you know, people shop with their eyes, and there's a couple things that <sighs> that we did, but you know, people shop visually as much as anything else, and and people shop fast. So, yeah. You know, um, so there's a balance of, you know, I, I got this this into this process of anytime you're you're doing these jobs, establish the basic facts. So how many words are on the page? Um, what are what's people's behavior? So do they scroll through the whole page? You know, what is their scrolling behavior? Where do they pause? Where are they pulling the information out? And and how much information? So when I um, say we looked at what questions people asked, you know, Amazon did hundreds of sitting with customers watching them shop eyeball tracking studies so we could match that uh, with the metrics we saw of how far down they scroll on the page okay. how much difference do reviews matter um, what are the keywords uh, and what questions are they asked so when you're shopping for books the questions you're asking are do i know this author do my friends know this author um, is this book recommended you know i'll tend to read more things all of us will from if we have trust in the author or if we have trust in the recommendation. Yeah, or if it looks nice. Yeah, well, sometimes if it looks nice, right? Um, versus, hey, you know, you're, you're buying a Makita drill, you know, how, how powerful is it? What's the battery life? What's the battery capacity? Right. You're asking a different set of questions. You're asking feature attribute questions. So um, I've since, you know, since leaving Amazon, I've worked with a number of e-commerce companies on how to align Exactly what you said. How do you get the information? What is the thing I'm looking at? Is it the one for me? And how do I get it? Right. Right. So do I know what I'm looking at? Who hasn't bought something? Like, I thought it was a lot bigger. <laughs> it looked bigger in the picture. And right. it showed up at my door and it was this big instead of this big. Or it looked like it was made out of metal and yeah. it was plastic. It looked yeah. like it was made out of metal. <laughs> right. So um, what, am I, what am I actually looking at is actually a whole set of questions. And then the is it the one for me? Um, and... I, Talk about day one, I still get annoyed with Amazon. Uh, I'm like, if I bought a drill, it doesn't mean I want 17 more drills. And by the way, I'm a Makita guy, so why do you show me anything from DeWalt? <laughs> yeah, it's uh, they don't, they still don't quite know the customer. Right. Yeah, and then and that is the key is that you're you're trying to understand a person's problem mm -hmm. as opposed to an, an algorithm. When I worked um, in a bike shop when I was 15, 16 years old, like I knew my customers and I could anticipate, oh, they've got someone going to college. They're going to need a bike lock. You right. Know? And we have a personal connection that I can anticipate and think about what they're doing. Yeah. Why'd you choose to leave Amazon? Uh, so Amazon had gotten a point, two things. Um, one, I like the innovation. And I'd gotten to a point where there's just a lot of operations. So the ability to set aside a bunch of people uh, was to, to work on, hey, let's try this experiment, uh, was getting less and less. Um, also, as a company, you know, Amazon's culture continued to evolve, and I wanted to be at a different place, you know, be someplace smaller, uh, be with more focus on innovation. Yeah. And so you left and started Foundry. Um, yeah, there's a bit of an intermediate in yeah, there. So I saw on your your LinkedIn you got three months Megan family there the the Haney family trip. Well, first off, I mean working Amazon is super intense. And yeah, yeah. and so uh yeah, I did you know left Amazon and, and uh um was was like, Hey, I, sometimes I call it Amazon detox or I talk to other people who've been there a long time, right? And you're just like, I have to reset a bunch of habits. Um just hold on. Um do I need to fly coach to India anymore? No, I'm not, you know, if I can help it, no. Um, <laughs> the, it was on detox. How frugal do I need to be? But um, you know, also, I started a period, so I did mostly consulting for the next uh, the next two years. Um, and I didn't know, do I, I mean, I liked building things the Amazon way. Do I want to help companies build things the Amazon way, put those kind of processes into place, help them be more successful by putting mechanisms in place? Do I want to work in data? Uh, do I work in e-commerce? Um, and then also Amazon is unique in that your technical business and uh, customer focus. So you can go from meeting about APIs to a meeting on P&L uh, to a meeting on a customer feature. And a lot of other companies are more segmented. You're the CIO. Please just deal with data. Right. Um, the finance guys will deal with finance. Uh, so it, I created a bunch of small consulting projects over the next two years to really test what would I like to do? What size of company would I like to be in? Right. So, but you did eventually end up 
Yeah. Creating so Foundry. Foundry. Yeah. So Foundry yes. came about as as I was working and continued networking. Um, we saw that uh, another ex Amazon person. I saw that the, our approach with data and structure. Um, we saw that many Amazon sellers didn't scale. They would hit you know anywhere in the five to ten million dollars in sales and kind of plateau. And I believe there's some simple reasons for that. Um, you start something up, you're a generalist, and once you get a certain size, there's enough work that you probably need a specialist. Right. Um, you need someone just to work in your merchandising. And many of those companies would outsource it. They would hire a service to handle their advertising. And that's not going to get the growth um, necessarily. It's just handling the size of business that you've grown into. Right. Um, so we started developing who would we... In, and we saw at the same time this aggregator trend where other com- other people were getting money, buying these sellers and rolling them up. So we came up with a business model for that uh, to build a portfolio of Amazon e-commerce sellers, what we thought we could centralize for processes to uh, drive value and accelerate growth or re-accelerate growth in the businesses we bought. So yeah, we went out and got money and built a team and created Foundry. And yeah. uh, Foundry bought... 14 some odd businesses and uh, has been growing them at 10 to 30 percent and uh, uh, we stopped buying businesses because the the financial markets became a little more difficult to go get money to buy businesses with yep um, so I stepped out of the day-to-day operations once that happened but yeah what yeah. what did you um, when you were at foundry how did you choose what companies you wanted to go buy accumulate um, help and what companies you kind of wanted to steer clear from yeah that was the magic sauce of the whole aggregator market which has been kind of a wipeout right we know thrasio has gone bankrupt um, and is reestablishing. you know a bunch of these aggregators many of them consolidated or you know over 29 billion dollars of various investment money has been just wiped out um, and a lot of it has to do with how they chose their companies to buy so um just to back up for me, I said, I like to learn. One of my career checkboxes was at Amazon. I'd never worked with private equity or venture capital. So I was curious to have an experience to learn what is it like to work with private equity and venture capital. Right. Um, our investors were very close to us in uh, our acquisition criteria. And one of our founding members had come out of private equity. And so we built a structure. What we were looking for is businesses that had certain operations criteria. Um, uh, so we knew a uh, number of metrics we were looking for operations. We wanted to buy similar businesses so that we could um, start folding them into portfolio um, and, and build a brand because I, I don't think as many Amazon sellers are brands as they actually think they are. Um, so we wanted to be able to have aligned and similar businesses. And then there was a number of financial performance. So we treated our acquisitions very similar to PEVC investments. Um, we didn't just buy anything that was available and we looked at purchase price. So we evaluated hundreds of businesses and um, probably proposed purchases to a few dozen and we ended up buying about 14. Yeah. There's also um, currently a kind of in the, in a similar vein, um, a trend of people doing Amazon drop shipping Mm -hmm. Um, as kind of a get rich quick scheme. Do you generally see uh, individuals doing that as a good or bad thing for Amazon? I, I don't know if I know enough about Amazon dropshipping, what you mean by that. So, okay. yeah. So if you want to unpack the example, I can probably give you an opinion. Yeah. Um, I'm, I haven't been in that world. Okay. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a bit a, of a... Amazon's a great break. marketplace. And, yeah. and there are, there are um, in any great marketplace, there are thousands, well, there's billions of eyeballs um, right. And so, but Amazon is not like a river or, you know, imagine trying to get attention at, you know, a big sporting event, you know, you're just well, I don't like, you know, hi over here, buy my beer. Yeah. Um, so you either have to get on the billboard or you have to have lots of people running around. However, so you still have to get those eyeballs once you get online to Amazon, yeah. but in any big ecosystem, I mean, you're talking about a $500 billion economy, um, which is bigger than a lot of countries. Uh, there's a lot of hustles, yeah. right? And so I think any of these drop shipping, I've seen other hustles over the last 20 years on Amazon. Um, there's a hustle is a, probably a short term, uh, money making thing because you're not necessarily building a business or you're not necessarily building a business structure or a business machine. You're probably just hustling. Yeah. And that's okay. Uh, if you want to hustle, go hustle. 
Yeah. Uh, but understand it, it's not necessarily durable. Right. There's a time where you have to settle down and build a business yeah. or do something else. Yeah. Um, and you spent quite a bit of time advising uh, C-suites, executives, and businesses. What is the kind of biggest mistake you see from a lot of these people um, that's holding them back? Well, <laughs> tell us, what, what, what mistakes, where do you see CC screwing up? I'm not sure how I want to go on that question because some of these are my clients. Yeah. Um, you know, I think there's a, a number of things that I do and, and I think we all make as, as mistakes that um, I'm just going to apply some Amazon leadership principles uh, very clearly. Yeah. One is there is always a pressure if you see something that's not performing the way you'd like it to perform. Um, you're not getting the results you want. Um, there is a tendency to go to single causes. Um, like whoosh, you just narrow down your focus. Anybody under stress, just narrow their eyes, dilate and narrow down their focus versus going, Hey, is it a mental model problem? Is it something we believe? Um, you know, we believe Amazon's next day shipping is really important. Well, or two day shipping is really important. Well, that's true here, but it's not true in the UK or Germany. Two day slipping shipping is really slow. Right. Um, so something we believe might be broken. Do we have the right data? Are we looking at this? Jeff's question, you know, customers will send something to Jeff, you know, some reason they feel the need to send something to Jeff Bezos or now Andy Jassy that will get forwarded down with a question mark and you get a question mark email, you know, why did this cost so much? I saw this price, this on Amazon, but the local Walgreens has the same exact thing for half the price. You know, cause Amazon builds on automated systems. So they might've gotten the price wrong, right? Well, somebody's got to go investigate that. Yep. Um, and, and so being close to the customer is something I'm going to, sorry, just go back to the systems. So what is broken in the system that generated that price? Is it something we believe? Is it one of the, is it a missing data point? Is it the, the process steps? Is it the actual person that's running something? Uh, we're missing a role or the role is defined wrong. Though that's a structured way of doing problem diagnostics in a system thinking versus, Hey, oh, this is wrong. Oh, this is so-and-so's job. They're failing. Or, right. you know, oh, this is wrong. We need to hire somebody. Uh, we need to hire a person. Really? Um, are we sure? Um, so single causes and having a structured diagnosis of, of systems will produce what systems produce. So if you're getting outputs you don't like, let's look at the whole system and see where the different points are that's pr causing that production. That's probably the first and biggest. The second is... Um, a lack of understanding of inputs and outputs. So Amazon, you know, I have all these phrases built up over years. You manage the inputs and monitor the outputs. So in a startup, yeah, you need to focus on dollars and, and like, did we get sales? Did we get sales? Did we get sales? How many customers did we get? What customers are we serving? And those are outputs. And at that life cycle of a company, customer acquisition and sales are super important. Um, totally get it. Once your company's more mature, um, are you really customer obsessed? And are, have you shifted to manage the inputs? So the inputs in an e-commerce company are super simple. It's traffic. You have to have eyeballs. You have to have selection. You have to have stuff to buy. Uh, you have to have competitive prices. And, and then you have to have a great experience. Uh, that's the Jeff Bezos on a napkin flywheel, right? Yep. Most, and if you manage those inputs, we believe <coughs> it's the flywheel. It's the Jim Collins good to great flywheel concept. If you put energy into anywhere on the flywheel, it will create more output, which is more sales and more customer lifetime value. Right. If you haven't defined what your inputs are and you're not getting curious input, you haven't made the jump from managing outputs, you're probably just guessing. Uh, if we do this, then hopefully this will happen. And hope is not a good strategy. No. So understand your inputs to manage your outputs. What made Just Jeff monitor Be your outputs. Yeah. What made Jeff Bezos so great? I have no idea. Okay. <laughs> you know, Jeff has an interesting story. And, you know, I think a couple things about working with Jeff. Uh, first off, um, he does have a really loud laugh. <laughs> it really is loud. He has, a, he has like uh, a rich laugh, too. Yeah, and it's a rich it laugh. It screams money. Um, and, and he, you know, a couple things about Jeff that help sometimes super libertarian, super science fiction y, um, you know, totally the nerd, came from a, you know, uh, uh, Originally came from a single mom and got married into um, his dad made or his, he spent summers in his grandparents. So, you know, people talk about like, 
does he really know how to work? Yeah, when he was 12 and 13, he spent summers on his grandpa's ranch in Texas in the heat digging post holes, right? You know, and you and I know what you know hard work on a farm looks like. Yeah. So his job. Yeah. Um, so, but he, um, he, a couple things that are unique about Jeff, incredibly customer focused, keeps, and, and like many good leaders, an amazing simplifier, um, goes from principles to methods, principles to methods really quickly, um, and could bring things back to first principles really quickly and amazing Ram. Like, so we were reading documents and he'd get the chart on page one, uh, versus your chart on page 13 versus the chart in the appendix over here on page three. They seem to have different definitions of these numbers and this KPI that are actually about 7.2% different. <laughs> How'd you know that? How'd you know that? <laughs> right? So, yeah, somebody else um, described Jeff as uh, 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 like the friends list of business. So friends list of great pianists and you just kind of had to leave piece, pieces out of the composure, composition to keep him engaged. Yeah, you know, like Jeff's ability to make hops uh, and logic super quick. Yeah, yeah that's is wild. Um, in, in in two weeks, I had you know one meeting with Jeff where um, uh, he called me smart and uh, a email that went out to you know thousands of tech leaders you know where we're discussing this thing uh, publicly in front of all of them, and he called me not so smart. So <laughs> you know you have to um, you know, that that simplification was. Thinking about things like the stock market in the short term is a voting contest, uh, but over the long term, it's a scale measuring business value. And you can apply that principle to a number of things. You know, hey, Jeff called me smart. Yeah, I'm awesome. No, nope, you know, that's just a moment you in did time. One thing. I did one thing. Yeah. Right. And, uh, and, you know, that's okay. And same thing, like Jeff said that thing was dumb. You know, that's okay. okay. I do that's a lot a of thing. dumb things. So, you know, yeah. You know, we'll just tell everyone. Yeah. What kind of people make good executives and what kind of people do not? Yeah, I don't know how qualified I am on, on, on to say that. I think, you know, one of the things that <laughs> was unique about Amazon in the 2000s, early 2000s, they had a very stable leadership team. Uh, the senior vice presidents um, were the same people for nearly a decade, and that's unusual at some of these big companies. Um, and it was very, I would also say, kind of Knights of the Round Table-esque um, at Amazon, you didn't need to have like every all those senior vice presidents agree. As long as you had, if you want to run a project or do something, you needed one senior vice president sponsor who was willing to say, "I will sponsor this," um, and and make it happen. Um, and and Jeff, the way he ran things, you know, it was pretty. That senior vice president team was also pretty diverse. Like if you apply a Myers Briggs profile, uh, personality profile, that senior leadership team, I think everything was, was represented. Yeah. Um, so I had a, a meeting where I was building a recommendation system for small business sellers on Amazon called Nudges. And uh, we're reviewing our annual plan with Jeff, and Nudges had a goal uh, that was an Amazon S team goal. And we would view these documents as everybody would read. And Jeff reads a document, it's library silent. And Jeff takes about 15 to 30 minutes per page because he assumes when he reads that it's not true until you make the logical proof in the paper that it is true. So you very clear, like if you make a statement, then where's the data and the logic to support it? Um, and then when we're, the, the next step after everybody's done reading is like, okay, let's have comments. And the first person that, that gives comments is to Jeff's left and it's the CFO. And then it goes around and we'd gotten to a gentleman named Diego Piscentini very flamboyant Italian marketing guy. Awesome. Super, super interesting guy. Uh, and he's like, I don't understand why 18 recommendation algorithms is right. Shouldn't it be 80, maybe 800? Like this should be really personal. We should have a lot of these. I'm like, okay, good feedback, right? Feedback is a gift. Um, I may not do exactly that thing, but I may so not discard it. Gotta but, have a ton of ideas. Right. But well, it's a direction, right? Yeah. You know, he's not telling me to make 800. He's giving me a direction. How, how personalized these need to be. We come back around, we go through some of the other people. We get around to Jeff's advisors, a guy named Dilip Kumar. And then we get to Jeff and Jeff's like, I don't know why you need 18. I think four, four would be good. Four is probably sufficient. I was like, he said 800. He said four, right? But in that executive, like Jeff waited, a like, incredibly patient. We're pushing on the idea, right? The two of them start talking Right. So I didn't even have to say, 
how do I reconcile the 800 guidance with the, the four or eight guidance? It's all good. Right. Um, and so that patience, that ability to, you know, and sometimes you just have to just say like to trust your people, Jeff's like, well, I hope I'm wrong, but you've heard me. You've heard what my concerns and risks are. I'm glad to disagree and commit. Right. right? Um, this is in your space. Go do it. Yeah. Um, so I think executive patience is key. I think the uh, executives to simplify and focus. Um, it's hard for executives and I struggle with, I can see a big picture, but my employees are maybe not as capable to see the whole big picture. And so I have to, you know, give them a focus point, um, and, and to create a path to focus. And then third is understanding we're on a learning journey and, and we could be wrong. Yeah. Right. So driving that, like we're wrong. Yeah, and there's a lot of humility in that as well. Yeah, um, that comes with that patience. And I could be wrong. I am the CEO. I founded this company. I could be wrong. Let's find out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One of our, I mean, Jeff, Jeff invented the fire phone. So you know, um, you know, which we all know was. And so the question is not whether you fail. It's it's what do you do to recover from failure? Right. Um, and so out of the fire, out of the ashes of the fire phone came the Alexa. Which you know may or may not be the long, long term success, but you know it was a pretty very you know, it's very successful. It was pretty successful. Yeah, absolutely. Um, they also say consistency always wins in business. Is that generally a good guiding principle? Um, what do you mean by consistency? Um, just well, don't quit your business, <laughs> um, but also like find a problem and um, consistently go after it. Is I think that kind of the things you've been saying. Well, you want to get just, to the bottom of the box. Right. right. And so um, we'd have I'd have a number of MBA interns uh, over my time there. And I'm like, we're starting with this question um, and we want to get to the bottom of the box. Your internship will be successful. Now, everybody wants to have an internship that launches a new business line or builds a new product or whatever. But it's more important that we get to the bottom of the box to go. Is this a good idea or not? Um, right. And what did we need to know and explore right. to see whether this was a good idea? Uh, so, you know, I don't know if that's consistency, um, but driving deeper understanding and, and of a business problem and getting closer to your customers. Um, I'll go back. I still think, and the CEOs are not, it's easy. You get, you get further away from customers and yeah. so get closer to customers and empower the people who are closest to the customer to make the decision. Yeah. And that's its own a story about and on cords and giving the ability of customer service people to push a button to take anything off the website um, is really nervous for CEOs and category leaders, but really empowering because your customer service people are the closest to the customer. Yeah. yeah. There's a reason why I'm wearing flannel today. So when and why should um, someone start a business? Is it you have an Jeez. idea? Is it um, I see a problem? What is the what should be the driving indicator or the um moment that says okay i need to do something about this um well yeah I, I was, I'm not sure i'm good on my feet on that question i'll tell you some things i've seen um you know business at the end of the day is um fundamentally around the law of equal exchange i will purchase your thing when i think i'm getting equivalent value right yep. and there's um a margin and as a business person uh, when should I start a business? Uh, that's an, do I have something to bless someone with? Right. Can right. I, so I'm going to start from some customers. How can I bless them and, and bless customers, bless employees? Like how can I bless them? Right. Um, and I know you're familiar with that you know, kind of framework. So, yeah. you know, what I think um, can happen though, um, is you, especially in those early days, like, Oh, I have an idea. Um, you get, there's a path of a, there's a business and there's so the book e-myth will talk about the classic I'm I'm a good baker I'm gonna start a bakery well you're a good baker a bakery is a business yes. you know, are you a good business person right yes. and so as your business scales there is a short-term window of great you're the one baking you're serving customers you're clearly the person there but at some point there's now division of labor and if you're serving customers, you're not the one baking. And so does that start to fall apart? If you go back to baking, do you have service customers? So start a business when you have uh, something that you can provide to customers in a consistent way over time that um, 
you know, sometimes we'll talk, look, is there a customer need? Uh, do you have a plan for executing on it? And now is it a hobby or business? Um, does that dog hunt is how I've heard one old guy say it. Of, does that plan actually generate margin revenue? Right. So, you know, hey, there's no donut business in our town here. Um, I've heard this over and over. I'm like, that dog doesn't hunt. Yeah. Uh, how many donuts would you have to sell to make, you know, six grand a month? Um, and a lot of that's donuts. just revenue. Like how much would you have, you know, like if you made six grand of profit a month um, right. to turn this into a, you know, $80,000 profit business? So uh, run the math. So run the math. And yeah. you know what? That's a great hobby. Right. Um, so you have to have those three things. Are there a bunch of customers who'd be blessed by what you do? Uh, and do you have a plan to do it with efficiency? Um, and does it work out? Does it create fruitfulness? Does it create a proof fruitful return? Right. When is the point when you should say, all right, this needs to close down? Um, we haven't been making money and, uh, you know, I don't see a path forward. What is the point where you just say, all right, three months ago, <laughs> there you go. We tend to, so again, that email thing, we get, we get in love with our idea. We get in love with our hobby mm -hmm. and you know, I probably should have quit or I probably should have left Amazon earlier. Um, and, and you know, we're doing things and, and we're not necessarily remembering the why or the, the what. So, yeah. And when that, when that disappears, it's yeah. time to go. And, and again, if you're, if you're not, if you're, if you're working from the outputs, how many sales, how many customers, how many dollars versus the inputs, so if you're managing if you're managing the inputs, do I have selection? Do I have competitive prices? You're going to see earlier that your inputs. Do I have repeat customers? Do I know what my customer sentiment is? Are my customers yeah. still finding value? When you're managing those inputs, you're going to have earlier indicators on should I start a business? Well, am I providing something valuable to customers? Right on a consistent basis. Yeah, what would be your best uh, business books to to give advice? Read. I like All old that. books uh, that have been durable. Um, there's a lot of, of the making of many books. There's no end. Yes. So I always start. There's some classics. Um, so Peter Drucker, I like the effective executive, but anything by Peter Drucker is usually has value to it. Um, but the book that I recommend over and over again is managing management time by William Unkin. Um, it has been more helpful than uh, any book in terms of scaling as an executive. Uh, and then, um, I, I have a, uh, and then I have a 10 pack, uh, that really is business strategy and product. Um, I've occasionally posted it on LinkedIn. Um, and it really goes through, do you understand how to organize your time and organize your time for impact? Um, how do I get the most impact per unit of time that's unique to what I can do versus others? Right. Um, Drucker and Ankin are pretty good at that. Um, the uh, and then everybody's got to deal with data, and so I'm really enjoying a book right now called Now You See It, uh, Data Sense Making by Stephen Few. Uh, I think it's you know, page one, 104 to 130 uh, is just fantastic. And if you just learn those pages, you will be a better data analyst in anything you do. Yeah, what's your best piece of advice you would give to anyone watching? Um, you know, again, I think, um, starting from basic facts. You know, how many customers, what's around me, you know, establishing, we, we just live through things so much, um, start with basic facts and look to provide, how can I provide a blessing to others and be useful? Yeah. You know, how can I be uniquely useful uh, to those around me and then keep learning because yeah. the world's changing around us. So, uh, I have more things to learn. So is everybody else. Absolutely. Yeah. Where can people find you and your work and all of that online? Uh, best place to find me is on LinkedIn. So uh, I'm on LinkedIn and that's the best place to find my posts and um, find uh, podcast links as I'll usually refer them there. And uh, that's the easiest place to connect with me. Thoughts and ideas. There yeah. you go. Thank you so much for coming on the show. It's been my wonderful. pleasure. Thanks, Jackson. Yeah. See you guys.